the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get your free financial survival toolkit and find out where to buy gold and silver safely at great prices. Sign up at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. 1490 WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network, which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold since 1990, and I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. To find out more, go to milesfranklin.com or call them at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. The markets, especially for junior miners, whether it be gold or in other areas, have just been hit so hard. They've been in a, a real bear market, worse than many people can remember. Certainly, the worst one since two thousand eight. To clear up some of the dispute over what is really going on. I've got Jeb Handwerger of goldstocktrades.com. Hey, Jeb, how have you been? It's been a while. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, things are going good. Tough market out there. But just as uh, like we've seen it come down, we're going to have a very powerful upturn in the, the mining sector. And what, what makes you think we're going to have that upturn? Well, right now, what we're seeing is that investors are um, dr- being driven into the cash, into treasuries, uh, into a record level of uh, retail investors are reaching now a record position in institutions in the dollar and treasuries. We think the dollar and treasuries are very overbought and reaching a mania. And there's going to come a, a time where it's going to pop. And investors are going to be looking for safe havens, and they're going to look for the miners, the producers, the the like Goldcore uh, and Newmont and Barrick are dealing with declining reserve reserves and uh, declining organic growth from quarter to quarter. So we really think that they've done a poor job in in finding and and developing economic deposits, and they're going to be looking for growth. Uh, in, in the near term, I think there's going to be a lot of M&A activity, uh, and we've, we've just begun to see that. Mm-hmm. And what kind of prices do you think the majors are going to be paying for these juniors? Well, we just saw recently uh, Yamana Gold uh, buy out Extori Gold in Argentina, uh, and Extori was, was hit hard because in Argentina, um, Fernandez uh, there's been some issues with the rising taxes uh, and the rise of resource nationalism in Argentina. So Extori's share price was hit hard, and Yamana um, found that it was a, a good time to to uh, to get into that. And uh, we're seeing um, many of the large miners, such as Barrick, Newmont in Peru, is dealing with violent protests. Um, we saw South American silver in Bolivia, a mine get a major silver mine get nationalized there. We're seeing Pan American silver uh, with their Navidad project in Argentina. They paid five hundred million dollars uh, for this in two thousand nine, and they're they're uh, pulling out because of the the, the restrictions uh, on the government with rising taxes. So uh, there's there's a lot of catalysts uh, that that we think that these large miners are going to have to find good economic resources in mining friendly jurisdictions. It makes a lot of sense. I, I see your point there. Yeah, I had owned Extori a while ago, bought it pretty dirt cheap. And then it, it went up. I don't remember how much it went up from what I paid for it, like six or seven times, I think. Is that right? Or three or four times. You can get out with a profit if you do it right. Yeah, that's an interesting issue you're discussing there of mining nationalism and that these companies are just, these countries are just basically stealing the mines, eventually they're going to have to pay because there is an international court that compensates companies for expropriation. However, the process takes many, many years, could take over 10 years. I've seen it take over 20 years 
In the meantime, right. they're exploiting the mine, and in all likelihood, they're not going to manage it properly. They're going to wind up uh, getting dwindling returns from that mine, and they're going to wind up paying a lot more. But in the short run, it feels good. Right. And that we're seeing it not just only in the precious metal sector. We're seeing that in the uranium sector. Uh, we're seeing that in the uh, the rare earths. So I think that we're going to see a lot of consolidation, especially at these levels where the miners, the, the we've had a really paradoxical market. I mean, we've had since October of 2011, we've had the S&P 500 going up, and that's really been led by – been a very narrow rally, pretty much based in the sectors that are that have been the most toxic sectors, such as the home builders, the banks, Bank of America, um, and the resource sector, uh, which you know the the wealth in the earth sector, the 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 venture index, which is looking for exploring and, and developing resources, is trading at near three year lows, and it hasn't kept up to pace with the S&P 500 but we think that's going to be going to change the the market is the markets in the junior miners are deeply oversold record historically historic value opportunities like we saw in 2008 and if you remember in 2008 uh, after uh, Obama was elected and they they did the fis- major fiscal stimulus you saw what sort of rally we had in the miners and how fast they made back those gains. And I think that we're going to see something like that in the, in the near term as investors become very skeptical of the high debt level in the United States. You know, we're concerned so much right now with what's going on in Europe and the high debt level in Spain and, and in Greece and Italy. Uh, so the dollars, the recipient uh, is getting some of the benefits of that, but we must not forget that we're reaching record debt levels uh, over the past two administrations with President Bush and, uh, and, and President Obama, over $15 trillion. This is definitely going to affect interest rates. Uh, we, th- we think that we're really nearing a top in the treasury, in the long-term treasury market. And that may be the reason why we're seeing Bernanke not instituting a QE, because Maybe they're realizing that the QE and the operation twist that they've already driven it to record low yields, and it's really not helping out. Maybe the next move is is that they're going to do some sort of devaluation uh, without quantitative easing, where they maybe punish or tax uh, businesses or institutions or in- investors uh, that are holding dollars and hoarding dollars because that's what's what's ex- what's happening right now. Uh, where they could just devalue the dollar or penalize or tax uh, investors that are holding too much dollars. I'm not sure about that because uh, I think it's print or die. I think they're printing as much or more than they've been printing all along, and they're just trying to make it look like it's not really happening. They're just using a little bit of sleight of hand. But in the final analysis they are going to uh, print because they have no other choice because we've got this humongous deficit. And how do you pay off the deficit? How is that deficit going to be made up? It has to be made up uh, in some way, right? And so, so Kerry, why do you think that, that since the QE2 expired in 2011, why do you think Bernanke's been waiting so long for QE3 and, and pushing this operation twist? Well, it's it's kind of a simple matter. It's it's that they don't want to call it QE3 because that is really injurious to the market. So they're never going to call it QE again. But just because they don't call it that doesn't mean they're not doing it. Look, they sent out $16 trillion in 09 when the banks blew up around the world. We don't know what happened to that money, if it's being paid back, if interest is being paid on it. But let's just say they're just collecting interest on it at a couple of percent, at one or two percent. That's enough to take that interest and reinvest in more treasuries or more government bonds. And the other thing is because they do all these swaps with the different central banks around the world, they do a swap with the ECB and the ECB buys the U.S. paper. It's all being done just indirectly. I don't believe 
it's a direct hit like well, QE3, but it's well, being issue, done. The issue that I think it really is be, is going to become a, a much bigger issue is that the dollar, uh, you know, the dollar has gone stronger, and you know the you the the U.S. government is not going to be able to maintain. Uh, to pay off all these ent- the entitlement spending, uh, which is increasing rapidly, and this recent Supreme Court decision with the health care costs, uh, with which is going to just going to cause entitlement costs to even rise further. Uh, there's the only the only thing that the government's going to be able to do uh, is going to have to su- to promote some form of significant inflation to close the deficit. I mean, the only other way is to politically, to, is as it would be a political nightmare, which is which is toxic, uh, which is is which is cuts, um, and uh, raising the the retirement, I mean, raising the age for re- retirement benefits, and you know, the politicians are not going to do that. You know, it's too too much of a political nightmare for them. So, really, there's going to have to be some sort of significant uh, way of inflating. Uh, and devaluing the currency in order to close down, close the deficit and pay down these debts. Yeah, there's no question. Uh, I talked with a guy by the name of John Aziz yesterday, and he said, and it's kind of what we've been saying all along, you and I, but he said it in a very, uh, in a better way. He said, there's only three choices here. Number one is print and pray. Print and pray that you're not going to destroy the currency. Number two is out and out default all right and number three is debt forgiveness or effectively the debt jubilee and i won't get into the whole biblical aspects of it i only look at the biblical aspects as a historical record that it's been done many times in the past will be done now those two alternatives of out and out default or debt forgiveness are probably the best solutions but they are the least politically feasible both in terms with our international trading partners and with the banks. The bank's debt forgiveness, debt jubilee means asset jubilee, and asset jubilee means the banks no longer exist, and you've basically got to close them down and start new ones and basically end the financial system as we know it. We both know they're not going to do that, right? So inflation is the one alternative. However, you know, they're really playing with fire and they know it and they they've trying to hide the fact they're doing it. We know that they're doing it because we've got a $1.5 trillion deficit job. Where's the money going to come from for that deficit? And that deficit's only going to go higher as the debt goes higher. And as the commitments to the retiring baby boomer generation start getting relied upon, right? There is no other choice. Yeah, and that's why I think right now, if you're a precious metals investor uh, and you're looking for, and if you believe in the long-term bull market in precious metals, then you're going to look you, you should, and believe that we're going to have a rebound, especially of where the precious metals come from, which is the mines. If we're going to see that the, the, the miners now are being priced for Armageddon, for gold prices, I mean – significantly lower, I mean, below $1,000 an ounce. And um, we think that gold price is going to go far over $2,000 an ounce. And that when that, when, when that, when that happens, um, the gold miners are so over, uh, oversold right now and, and so priced for a decline that when we see the opposite and we see an upward leg, the gold miners, while, while gold could go up a certain percentage, we see that the leverage that the gold miners and especially the high quality juniors, um, which you know investors have sort of neglected and shunned, you're able to get right now for pennies on the dollar. And I think that there's going to be some really massive amount of wealth being created for investors who um, are looking to get in at these levels, at these super depressed levels uh, and oversold levels. And that's in, in precious metals, that's in uranium. Uh, that's in the strategic metals and commodities where the supply demand funnels are only getting stronger, but the prices are, 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 are unbelievably discounted. I mean, I'm totally with you because for whatever reason, they've been in a, an effective depression 
over the past couple of years getting worse, but it looks like they've hit a bottom. Nobody can tell until after they start recovering, of course. So that's why it's really difficult to call a bottom because you only really know that for sure after the fact. So, Jeb, we got to get going to find out more about you, your work, your blog. Where should people go? Goldstocktrades.com. Sign up for my free newsletter. Uh, we have I come up with commentaries uh, several times a week. I also have interviews with different mining executives. Uh, so if you really want to learn more about the junior market in precious metals, uranium, and rare earths, go to goldstocktrades.com. All right, Jeb. Hey, thanks for being on. We'll talk to you again soon. Be well. Thanks, Carrie. All the best.